On Christmas Eve, 1971, Julianne Kupka fell from the sky. 53 years ago, she plummeted from 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet above the Amazon rainforest. She was the lone survivor of a plane crash in the heart of the jungle, and she not only defied all the odds and survived to tell the tale, but she began a mission to protect the very rainforest that she believes saved her life. Join us today for the story of Julianne Kupka, the girl who fell from the sky. Friends, welcome once again to the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. I'm Andrew Colon, and in this episode, I'll be your guide as we tell the incredible story of someone who not only survived a plane crash, but also survived 10 days in the Amazon rainforest against incredible odds. If this is your first time listening, thanks for being here with us and consider subscribing to the podcast so you never miss an episode and to be able to dive into the vault of over 40 podcasts where I tell the stories of the myths, legends, history, and mysteries of North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean for the whole world to know. Now, let's get to it, friends. Julianne Kupka was born in Lima, Peru to German zoologists who were working at Lima's Museum of Natural History at the time. At the age of 14, she left Lima with her parents to establish a biological research station in the Amazon rainforest in the village of Panguana, where her parents and the rainforest would teach her about life and survival. Julianne had been studying at a German international school in Lima, and the educational authorities in Lima at the time, although she was studying in the village, required her to come back to Lima at age 17 to take her exams so that she could graduate. Her mother Maria went to Lima with her, and she wanted to return to the research station as soon as Julianne finished her last exam on the 19th or 20th of December. But Julianne wanted to stay until her graduation ceremony so she could graduate with her classmates. That was December 23rd, 1971. Her mother agreed that they could stay and they scheduled a flight back to the research station for Christmas Eve. All flights were fully booked as it was the holiday season, except for one with Lanza Airlines. Kupka's father, Hans Wilhelm, urged his wife and daughter to avoid flying with that airline as it had a horrible reputation. But they couldn't find anything better, so the flight was booked. On December 23, 1971, Julianne was on Lanza Flight 508 in seat 19F next to her mother Maria in the 86-passenger plane. 25 minutes into the flight, they found themselves in the middle of a massive thunderstorm. The plane flew into a swirl of pitch black clouds, and all Julianne could see were flashes of lightning exploding through the windows. Turbulence threw the plane around in the storm, and luggage started falling out of the overhead compartment, prompting her mother Maria to say, in German, hopefully this goes all right. And then the worst happened. From her seat, Julianne could see lightning all around the plane, and then one bolt of lightning struck directly at the right engine. Julianne gripped her mother's hand. This is the end. It's over were the last words Maria Kupka, her mother, would say. And then suddenly, she no longer felt her mother's hand there. The force of the strike broke the plane into pieces. Julianne heard screams and the noise of the motor, and then all she could hear was the wind in her ears. The next thing she knew, she was no longer inside the cabin. She was outside in the open air, and in her words, I hadn't left the plane. The plane had left me. Still strapped to her seat, Julianne Kupka realized that she was free-falling out of the plane. From over 3,000 meters above the ground, 10,000 feet, she anticipated what would happen. That her body would crash and she would die instantly. Still falling, she lost consciousness. Julianne doesn't know how much later but somehow her eyes did open and she was alive. With a horrible concussion and still in shock, she realized she had survived the accident, 
couldn't see out of one eye, had a broken collarbone and torn ligaments in one knee, and deep cuts and bruises, but she was still alive. And then she fell unconscious again. When she woke up from the concussion the next day, all she could process was that she had survived. Falling in and out of consciousness, it took her about 12 hours to fully awaken. She tried calling out for her mother, but there was no response. She was surrounded by jungle vegetation, debris of the airplane, clothing hanging from tree branches, and bodies in horrific states of dismemberment. Still searching for her mother, she found that many of the bodies were face down, and she used a tree branch to turn some of them over, horrified at the thought of finding her mother this way. But none of the bodies were hers. The plane crash prompted the biggest search in Peru's history at the time. In the aftermath of the crash, Julian said she could hear the sound of rescue helicopters and airplanes. But the dense jungle made it impossible for her to see them or for them to see her. The helicopters and planes couldn't even see any of the plane's wreckage under the cover of trees. It was as if the jungle had swallowed them all up. And then one day, there were no more helicopters. The search for survivors had been called off. So there she was, alone, injured, and in the Peruvian Amazon. Soon she began to hear and see vultures that began to fly over the bodies of the crash victims. She knew that if they were already there, that other animals of the forest would be there soon. It was at this point that Julianne knew that she would have to move if she wanted to survive the dangers of the rainforest, and she knew of the dangers of the wild animals, especially snakes and jaguars that could attack her as they lay camouflaged by the rainforest. But her family, especially her father, had taught her the basics of survival in the rainforest. She remembered that her father taught her to always look for water that a small creek or body of water could lead to a stream, and that a stream could lead to a river, and a river would lead her to help. But moving in the jungle wouldn't be easy for her. Her glasses were lost in the fall. One eye was seriously injured, and both were almost swollen shut, and she had a deep cut in one arm and a gash in one leg. Her knee was badly hurt, and she only had one shoe which made walking in the jungle painfully difficult. But she persevered and walked as best she could, and soon she found a small well of water, which was fed by a stream, and she followed that stream as it got wider and wider. Sometimes she would walk along the water's edge, and as it got wide enough, she started swimming in it. On the fourth day of her trek, she came across the terrifying sight of three fellow passengers still strapped to their seats like she was. They had landed head first into the ground with such force that they were buried three feet into the ground with their legs sticking straight up in the air. Horrified, Julianne realized that one of them was a woman. After checking though, Julianne confirmed that it was not her mother. But these unfortunate passengers did leave Julianne a gift, a bag of candies she found in their wreckage. These candies would be the only food source for her for the rest of her time in the forest. The brutal sun of the Amazon burned her skin as she walked and swam. She would go on to have second degree burns and she began hallucinating as she trekked, thinking of food and home. By day 10, she had all but surrendered to the jungle, and she'd let what now had become a river take her in its current. But the following day, she found her first sign of real hope, a boat tied off by the river's edge, and off in the distance, a small hut. There was no one there, and it didn't have much in it, but it was shelter, and she did find one thing she could use. Gasoline. You see, during her 11 days in the jungle, Julianne had been ravaged by insect bites. 
To make matters worse, the deep cut in her arm had become infected, and even worse than that, infested by botfly larvae. Julianne remembered that her family's dog had had a similar infection, and that her father had put kerosene on it to draw out the worms. So she siphoned out some of the gasoline and poured it into her wound. The pain was excruciating, but she managed to pull out about 30 worms from her wound, probably saving her arm or her life in the process. Exhausted, she spent the night in that hut. When she woke up the next morning, she thought she heard voices, but wasn't sure if they were real or if they were more hallucinations. The date was January 3rd, 1972. She said those voices sounded like angels to her. Well, they might have been angelic in saving her life, but they were real people. They were three humble Peruvian loggers who lived in that hut. They were actually a little scared by her at first. And with the sight of a red-faced, swollen-eyed, blonde-haired sprite, they thought she could be a water spirit or a demon. But once they knew she was harmless and human, they had her stay there for another night, fed her, gave her basic first aid, and the following day took her by boat to a local hospital located in a small nearby village. After she was treated for her injuries, Julianne Kupka was reunited with her father Hans Wilhelm. After recovering a bit, and I mean only a few days, Julianne went on to help authorities find the wreckage of the plane, and over the next few days, they were able to find and identify some of the victims. Her mother's body was discovered on January 12, 1972. Of the 92 people aboard, Julianne Kupka was the sole survivor. The world was moved. Not only did no one expect for there to be any survivors, she brought the horror of the crash to life for the world. Her incredible experience became world news. But life following the traumatic crash was hard for Julianne. She became a media spectacle. And this was pre-internet, pre-social media. Imagine what she would go through today. As you can imagine, she developed a deep fear of flying and for years had recurring nightmares of the crash and the aftermath. Later, Julianne would tell her story in her autobiography, but in 1998, she was featured in the documentary Wings of Hope, directed by celebrated German filmmaker Werner Herzog. But Herzog didn't just have an interest in telling an amazing story. He almost became part of the story as he was scheduled to take the same flight as Julianne and her mother as he was in Peru working on a film but had to change itinerary at the last minute. Herzog had planned to make the film shortly after the crash, but he couldn't find Julianne forever. She avoided the media as much as possible, not wanting to be known forever as a crash survivor. Herzog was finally able to find Julianne years later after locating the priest who officiated her mother's funeral. And finally, she agreed to tell her story in the documentary, where she revisited the crash site. And while it was very hard on Julianne, she did find it to become a kind of therapy for her, in her words. But how did she survive that fall? Julianne's unlikely survival has been the subject of much speculation. Experts say that she survived the fall because she was harnessed into her seat, the window seat, which was attached to the two seats to her left as part of a row of three. They think that it created enough drag in the air and slowed her fall. Others say the impact might have been lessened by the updraft from the thunderstorm that broke the plane apart, as well as the thick foliage at her landing site thinking her row of seats must have gotten caught in a tree where her seatbelt came apart from the impact and she fell through the trees and finally to the ground. Autopsies showed that as many as 14 other passengers also survived the initial crash but died while waiting to be rescued. Authorities say her mother Maria was one of them. Right after the crash, Julianne returned to her family's native Germany where she was able to recover from her physical injuries. 
her psychological injuries would take much longer. For years, Julianne suffered from nightmares and night terrors from the fall and her time lost in the jungle, and she thinks about those days often, and still feels the grief of her mother's death and that of the other people on the flight with her. The thought, why was I the only survivor, haunts her, and she thinks it always will. Like her parents, though, she studied biology in Germany, and after getting her doctorate, and despite this horrible crash and her torment in the jungle, Julianne came back to work in and for the rainforest. In 1989, she married German entomologist Eric Diller, and in 2000, after the death of her father Hans Wilhelm, she took over as the director of the Panguana Research Station, where she lived with her mother and father before the crash to continue their important work. She dedicated much of her life as a zoologist and to the conservation of the ecosystems there and became a distinguished expert in the field. In 2011, her autobiography titled, When I Fell from the Sky, How the Jungle Gave Me My Life Back, was released. And in 2019, the government of Peru made her a Grand Officer of the Order of Merit for Distinguished Services for her work. Today at the age of 69, Julianne lives in Munich, Germany, where she serves as a librarian at the Bavarian State Collection of Zoology and opts to use her married name of Julianne Diller to not always be known as the girl who fell from the sky. Now, whether you call her Julianne Diller or Julianne Kupka, her story is one of survival against some of the most incredible odds you or I will ever face. At 17 years of age, she was able to show perseverance, presence of mind, and clear thinking and determination I wish I had sometimes at my age. She was able to use what she'd learned and push forward and figure out the rest until she was out of danger. At 17, she experienced a trauma and grief many of us didn't have to experience at such a young age. As an adult, she was able to go back to the source of her trauma and grief and work to save the rainforest she loves so much. And despite the media treating her like a freak, back in the 1970s, she was able to come back, tell her own story, and get some closure from the experience. After hearing about this story and learning as much as I could about it, I knew I had to tell the story here on the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. While the story went around the world back in the 70s, Everyone I've asked about it recently has no idea what I'm talking about. That sealed the deal, and I knew the story of Julianne Kupka had to join the others in our growing vault of myths, legends, history, and mysteries. Friends, if you haven't already, consider subscribing to the podcast so you get all the episodes once they come out and get access to that vault of over 40 stories that are sure to show you just how incredible North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean can be. Thanks for joining us, friends. My name is Andrew Colon. Adios.